the ground rules in a minute. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. and go over the agenda briefly. Um, we'll start with uh, GPAC roll call, Pledge of Allegiance, and then approve the minutes from uh, our last meeting a week ago. Um, and the main purpose of the meeting today, though, is to continue our discussions on the goals and policies for various topics that will be addressed in the general plan. And today's topics are health and equity, as well as parks and recreation. Um, we'll briefly review what we've already heard from the technical analysis and through the community feedback in the last couple of years, and then uh, provide an overview of the key outcomes, goals, and policies uh, that will be contained in the general plan. Um, the purpose of uh, sharing that now is to get your input so those these can be refined um, and then included in the actual general plan document as we prepare it over the fall. Let's start with some introductions. Um, I'll have Carlene Saxon, Director of Economic and Community Development, introduce the city team. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. The last one. You made it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Carlene Saxton, as Simran said, Director of Economic and Community Development. We also have Megan Taggart, our Planning Manager, Ben Fiss, our Senior Planner, Drew Pletcher, our Deputy City Attorney. Um, I believe Steve Montenegro, our Urban Grounds and Green Space Superintendent is also on. Carrie Smith, our Director of Parks and Recreation. And then we have some staff from Public Works Traffic Transportation side as well. We look forward to the great discussions and thank you again for your commitment. Thanks, Carlene. Um, and you all know Melissa Stark, who's a senior planner, planner with Damien Associates. She's here and you'll be hearing from her today as well. Um, let's do roll calls for the GPAC. Uh, please unmute yourself and acknowledge um, that you are here. Um, Tony Avila. President, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Juan Blanco. Can you hear me? Because I'm on a headset tonight. <laughs> yes, we can. Welcome. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Lourdes Everett. Good evening. Present. Colby Estes. Yes, present. Laura Gordon. I'm here. Teresa Hambro. Good evening. Matt Harris. I'm here. Good evening. Aurora Hernandez. I don't think Aurora is here yet. Um, Pat Hunt. Living the dream. Terry Kanishira. I don't think she's here yet. Terry Lamping. Present. Uh, Debbie Rutkowski Hines, I believe, is out today, and Jason Zink. Present. Welcome, everyone. And now Melissa will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks. If you all could meet yourself, please stand, place your right hand over your heart, and begin after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and you may be seated. Thank you, Melissa. Um, the first item on our agenda is meeting approvals from our last meeting um, less than a week ago. Um, are there any comments, changes, for many of the GPAC members? And if not, is there a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Pat. Uh, second. A second? Juan. Thank you, seconds. Juan. Um, Melissa, would you launch the poll? Yes, I'm gonna launch our first poll for the evening. This is just for our GPAC members. This is to approve um, GPAC number 16 meeting minute. Please take a minute and submit your responses. I think that's 
everyone. Okay. Thank you all. Out of 10 folks, we have nine that vote yes and one that abstained. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So let's get started with the rest of the presentation. Uh, I think you all know the format. We'll stop several times for um, questions uh, along the way, and then we'll also ask some questions through the poll feature. Um, as you all know, there are limits to uh, how Zoom polls work, so sometimes the choices may not be as um, as extensive as we would like, but uh, we'd like you to raise your hands uh, for the GPAC members and share your comments that you think are not reflected in the options that are provided in the poll. Um, after the presentation is done, we'll have breakout rooms and members of the public will, uh, will have an opportunity to share their thoughts um, during that time. And then we'll also have official public comment uh, close to the end of the meeting. So let's get started with the first poll. Um, this is a poll you, you, we ask every time just to keep uh, have a sense of how many folks are attending regularly. So go ahead, Melissa. I'm going to launch the first poll, and this is for everyone in the meeting. Um, this asks two questions. The first question asks, how many general plan related meetings have you attended? And the options are, this is my first meeting, two to four meetings, five or more meetings, or I'm a GPAC member, more than five meetings. If you scroll down, you'll see the second question, which asks, how did you hear about this meeting? And your options are the Palmdale 2045 website, Palmdale Magazine, direct email, I'm a GPAC member, or other. Take a few seconds to submit your responses and we'll share the results with the rest of the group. I think that's just about everyone. We're going to close the poll and share the results. So in terms of how many meetings the folks have attended, it looks like we have four new folks. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We're happy you're here. We have five folks who have attended five or more meetings, which is amazing. Thanks for joining us again. Um, and then we have our GPAC, um, nine out of the total group. In terms of hearing about the meeting, um, Majority of folks are GPAC members, followed by several folks who found out um, via direct email, followed by another source, and then split um, evenly between the website and Palmdale Magazine for the last bit. So thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop sharing. And if you still see the screen in the upper right-hand corner, you can click the X button. So very briefly, I um, want to walk through what's required in general plans um, in California. And as I've noted previously, all cities in California are required to prepare a general plan, which is a long range policy document for the city. Um, and the state of California through OPR, which is the Office of Planning and Research, uh, um, requires or establishes what general plans must uh, must address. Um, there are nine topics that are um, that are required, um, which are listed on the screen in the left column. And we'll be talking about open space um, or, or a portion of open space, which is parks and recreation. Um, and then uh, the OPR guidelines also allow cities to address other considerations that are important for them um, and we'll be talking about healthy communities uh, as well as equity and resilience. Um, I should also note that we are discussing environmental justice today as well, and that should have been highlighted um, in the left column. Um, just a quick overview of the project. Um, over the last two and a half years, through an extensive community engagement process. Uh, we have worked with the community and the GPAC. Um, this is our 17th meeting um, to develop a vision and guiding principles. Um, and then we created land use alternatives uh, last, last fall um, and then selected a preferred plan. 
Uh, and now we are preparing the content for the general plan, starting with the goals and policies. So um, what we have been sharing this summer with you all are the policy frameworks, which are an interim step um, in the preparation of the general plan. And we want to get some initial feedback on the goals and policies on some of these major topics. Um, and for each of these topics over the last two and a half years, we have completed our technical analysis and received feedback from the community and, and the GPAC, as well as um, the decision makers, um, planning commission and city council. And now we are uh, reviewing the um, key outcomes, goals and policies uh, with you all to get additional feedback. Uh, and as I noted, today's topic is uh, health, environmental justice, equity, parks, and public facilities. Um, we'll start with an overview of the existing setting. Um, first, health and equity. Um, so the general plan will have a health equity and environmental justice element. And um, this is a recent addition to uh, what's required in general plans to be addressed, this topic is. Um, and this is based on SB 1000, which is also known as the Planning for Healthy Communities Act. Um, it was passed in 2016. Uh, and this mandate requires cities address health disparities and environmental justice issues in low-income communities within the area that's covered by the general plan. Um, the topics that need to be included include um, environmental pollution or exposure to specific pollution sources, um, built environment indicators such as safe and sanitary housing, access to parks, as well as crime and public safety. Other health in outcomes such as disease prevalence and access to healthcare also must be addressed. And then in combination with these, um, these topics, population characteristics such as income, race, ethnicity, and educational attainment also are to be considered since these uh, socioeconomic issues have been linked to disparate uh, outcomes in certain, uh, certain populations and groups. Uh, SB 1000 um, also mandates the methodology for determining if a community has um, disadvantaged communities. Um, and we had shared a detailed overview of this methodology last year, I believe it was in October um, at a GPAC meeting. Um, so today we won't go over um, that entire methodology again, but um, but in, uh, in summary, the, we went through the analysis process and identified uh, that Palmdale does indeed have areas that can be identified as disadvantaged communities. Uh, we have um, conducted engagement through stakeholder focus groups over the last several months. And, um, and now we are discussing the draft goals and policies to address um, the identified disadvantaged community needs. The next two slides on, uh, list some of the high level findings related to health and equity. Um, we use the state database uh, Cal and Viroscreen uh, to evaluate pollution impacts. And this database provides a relative score for every census tract in the state. And those in the top 25% are identified as impacted. So for the most part, um, Palmdale has lower exposure to many environmental pollutants. Um, so lower levels of particulate matters, uh, less toxic releases, fewer groundwater threats and cleanup sites. So that's the, that's the good news. Um, in terms of socioeconomic factors though, um, Palmdale has comparatively affordable housing compared to the rest of the county and to some extent the state and very high um, home ownership rates, again, in comparison to the county. And there are good jobs available in Palmdale, especially as they relate to um, the aerospace industry and other STEM fields. 
but there's a need for improved access to higher education and vocational education to match the current population to these jobs. So there's still work to be uh, done in this field. Um, some of the challenges and threats related to our findings include um, the fact that life expectancy in um, Palmdale is about four years lower than the rest of the county's average. And almost half of the population is under 200% of the federal poverty line. So that when linked with um, the, the news, the, uh, uh, that when linked with the finding that there's more affordable housing in, in Palmdale, which is good, there's, it also identifies there isn't enough affordable housing for the, uh, for the residents of Palmdale. Um, other findings include um, that less than half the population today is within 20 minutes walking distance of a park. Um, and then there's limited access to healthy, healthy food retailers and uh, across the city. Uh, and this is uh, through the entire city, not just the disadvantaged communities. One of the pollution factors that does rise to the top 25% of the worst census tracts uh, in the state is high levels of ozone. Um, and this is not specific to Palmdale, but it's a factor that affects all of Antelope Valley. Um, the annual average actually exceeds safe levels for vulnerable populations, especially those with certain health con conditions. Some of the related impacts can be seen in the health of Palmdale residents. Um, compared to countywide averages, Palmdale has higher rates of asthma and uh, asthma-related emergency room visits, uh, COPD, as well as coronary heart disease. Um, we also observe higher rates of obesity in both adults and youth. And there's a link to sedentary lifestyles, um, long commute times, and less smaller use of active modes of transportation, walking or biking in the community. And all these health impacts are disproportionately higher in low-income communities as well as communities of color. Uh, this map shows the census tracts um, with disadvantaged communities are shown in the orangey, uh, orange color on the map. Um, and these are the census tracts with populations that uh, are below the income threshold established by, the, uh, by SP 1000, uh, as well as um, these census tracts have one or more pollution burdens. Um, in most cases, that is uh, exposure to ozone. And the unpopulated census tracts, um, and these are areas which are agricultural areas, and the quarries or unpopulated hillsides are screened out, and those are shown in the, in the bright yellow on the screen. This slide lists some of the feedback we have heard frequently through the process and has been addressed through the land use and other policy frameworks as well. Um, and these include um, desire for additional medical and higher education facilities in the city, improved access for transit and other modes of uh, active transportation, such as walking and biking, um, more grocery stores across the city that sell um, healthy produce, um, as well as um, the desire to see more shade and tree trees uh, planted in within the city. So the topics that will be addressed in the health and equity element are cross-cutting with some of the other elements that we've discussed um, over the last several weeks. Um, and these include land use, mobility, economic development, safety, um, and safety. Um, and the specific topics that are to be included um, are economic opportunity and education parity, uh, access, improved access to healthcare, housing, um, obesity, or um, 
how to uh, how to reduce uh, um, the occur- occurrence of that within the within the city uh, improvements to air quality and respiratory health uh, improved access to healthy food uh, retailers primarily and uh, reduced crime and improved public safety so with that um, i will turn this over to Melissa to uh, cover some of the background findings on parks and recreation. Melissa. Thanks, Simran. So if you go to the next slide. So parks, recreation, and trails are required topics to be addressed in the general plan. This can be through a standalone element or included within an open space element. Um, it addresses, um, it maps existing planned and priority areas for parks, recreation, and trails. It includes a target or standard for public parks, usually expressed in acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. It helps set goals and metrics for the future and helps and has ways to track progress over time. And the element can also establish criteria for determining parks requirements and development through either dedication of land to be used for future parks or through an in lieu fee, which would go towards the city's fund for updating existing parks and or developing new parks. On the next slide, we highlight some of the existing conditions data for parks and trails in Palmdale. You'll see we have roughly 365 acres of parkland with a variety of, uh, of amenities. Um, the existing goal is to have five acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. So as of right now, we're only at about 45% of that goal. We need several hundred more acres to reach our existing standard. Um, in terms of heads and parking, et cetera, are fairly limited. Um, a few of them are listed here, but we know there are several more informal trails in the city's foothills. If you go to the next slide, um, in terms of recreation, the city operates 12 recreation and cultural facilities, including public pools, skate parks, the library, cultural center, legacy commons, um, the best of the West softball complex and dry town among many others. Um, this is a map of existing parks, recreation and trail facilities in Palmdale. Um, you'll notice it's a little hard to see, but there is a distinction between existing parks. Those are shown in more of a Kelly green. Um, and then future parks. So these are city owned properties that are planned in the future at some point to be a park. Um, the timeline may or may not be established yet. Those are shown in a brighter teal green. Um, and a lot of those I think are primarily on the east side of town. Um, we also know that several park sites also include recreation facilities like Marie Kerr and Palmdale Oasis. Um, and then purple, the purple circles indicate parks and parks and rec sites. As I mentioned, Marie Kerr and, and Oasis have um, additional recreation facilities. And then the dark blue indicate the standalone recreation facilities. Um, the orange circles are the trailheads. Um, and overall, you can see that there's pretty good coverage in terms of parks and trails and recreation, um, generally distributed across town um, and generally where people live. On the next slide, we have results from an access to parks analysis. Um, so this analyzes where residential and mixed use neighborhoods will be in the preferred land use map, which is the map that we spent um, probably the last year working on and recently finalized. Um, so it takes those area, areas and does an analysis of walk time to the nearest existing park. So the darker purple indicates a lower walk time of less than 10 minutes, and the light pink indicates a higher walk time of more than 30 minutes. Um, so despite our goal of wanting to see more parks, and being below our set standard in park acres, we have relatively good access to existing parks from residential and future mixed use areas. Um, you can see that a lot of the lighter pink areas are actually outside of city limits in the sphere of influence. Um, so that is really good news. 
On the next slide, we highlight some of the strengths and challenges from our background research and community feedback. Um, in terms of strengths, we have the 365 acres of parkland. We have several city-run cultural and rec facilities. There are existing partnerships within the Antelope Valley that offer community programs, and it's a city priority to maintain and improve existing parks and rec facilities. In terms of challenges, um, park and recreation funding is limited, especially for acquisition of new sites and construction of new facilities. And then access is both a strength and a challenge. We know that facilities are generally spread across town, which is great, that's a strength. But then um, we also know that some parks and rec sites are more easily accessible to certain residents and harder to access for others, which is a challenge. Let me go on the next slide. Um, so we also wanted to touch on some of the recent and upcoming parks improvements. We know um, parks and recreation are very important and a priority for the city, so it's great to be able to share some of this progress. Both um, Marie Kerr and Dominic Masari Parks have had recent upgrades to basketball courts. Marie Kerr has also had upgrades to children's play equipment and the addition of new adult fitness stations. And then the new Rancho Vista Park is underway. Um, it's expected to be completed later this year, I believe, um, and it will include things like an open grassy area for play, well-lit walking paths, connections to the nearby Esperanza Elementary School, um, restrooms, and a play structure. Next slide. So as with all elements of the general plan, there are several other topics that we incorporate through goals and policies. This element will touch on trails, open space, and natural resources in addition to parks and recreation. And I'll also mention here that there will be a separate element devoted to open space, conservation, and natural resources that will also link back to parks and recreation with some overlap. Go to the next slide. Um, in terms of existing plans and programs that are relevant, um, the city's 1993 general plan has a great parks, recreation, and trails element that is informing many of the goals and policies for the updated draft element. Um, the city's 2018 capital improvements plan is a plan that addresses physical improvements for the city and it details upgrades to existing parks and development of future parks and also identifies funds to make that happen over a 10 year period. And then I'll also mention that the city has a draft active transportation plan, which has some overlap with parks and trails. And the last slide. Um, so lastly, we wanna highlight some of the community feedback we've heard over the last two years related to parks and rec. We know it's a huge priority for the community and we've heard a lot of really great feedback. Um, there's definitely a desire for more parks, specifically neighborhood parks. There's a need for improved facilities and amenities at existing parks. Specifically, we've heard lighting and security. There's a desire for bike lanes and trails, especially with connections from existing neighborhoods to parks and open space. There's a desire to create more recreation facilities like public pools, baseball fields, splash pads, and dog parks. Um, we've heard several times about the need for activities for youth in Palmdale, so we hope to expand those. Um, we've heard about a need for programming for people of all ages, a general desire for more city events, which is great. Um, and then lastly, to preserve the desert atmosphere. So that's it for this section. I believe we have a brief pause here for any questions from our GPAC members, and then um, I'll turn it over to Simmons. Thanks, Melissa. Um... Yes, Tony. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, the health and equity subject matter. Uh, it's a two part mm -hmm. question. Have we identified why we have uh, higher levels of ozone pollution in Palmdale? And is this what is uh, contributing uh, to the, uh, the largest factor towards lower life expectancy? And if so, what are we doing to mitigate the pollution in our community as part of the general plan? And that's a really good question, Tony. Uh, you know, the ozone levels, I mean, that's a function uh, for the most part to, of the geography of Southern California and the way the Antelope Valley sits and how, um, how 
pollution moves across the LA basin um, and uh, and because of the altitude as well. Um, so in that sense, there is, um, there is limited um, actions that the city can take in, in the general plan itself. Um, there are other things like uh, improving air quality through more trees, uh, et cetera, that, that the city can do. And um, those are being addressed in the goals and policies that we'll go to momentarily. Okay, so ostensibly we're saying it's being created by other cities or other areas, but not by local businesses. Is that correct? That, that's right. Those aren't local polluters that are creating the ozone problems. As I mentioned, it's the entire Antelope Valley that has these higher levels. They're still within the, they're still within the um, levels um, what is established by um, my federal levels for for basic health, right? But the numbers are higher than the LA Basin, and um, on certain days, um, those are uh, those exceed the limits that are established by the by the state. And then, um, because of those higher levels, there are potentially some impacts on, on those who have certain health conditions. Thank you. What's the, what is the source of that data? Um, the source for that data is uh, a state database, um, as I mentioned, Callen Virus Screen, as well as Healthy Places Index. Thank you. Um, Aurora? Hi, sorry, I just want to clarify. Um, the lower life expectancy isn't due just to the air plumes, right? And I don't, I don't know if that was made clear. Like, right. Uh, yeah, it's due to like yes. a variety of factors, social determinants as, as well, right? Absolutely, you're right, Aurora. I should have um, uh, uh, I should have stated that more clearly. Um, lower life expectancy um, is it's it's a complicated issue. There's no one cause for it. Um, as Aurora said, there are there have been um, studies that have shown that there are many determinants of why that occurs. That includes race, ethnicity, income levels. Um, uh, as well as educational levels tied in with some of um, some of these other built uh, uh, built environment indicators that I had briefly described earlier, all of those together impact uh, life expectancy. All good questions. Uh, I, I, uh, I had a question. Uh, how do you put your hand up? First of all, um, are you if you're on a camera on, on a computer, you are able to hit more in the toolbar at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the option of raising hand. Correct, Melissa? There's also, I'm not sure what version you have, but there's a reaction button on the bottom uh, toolbar. The mm -hmm. And for, okay, for okay. most folks, right. that's where you would find okay, it. There okay, there you go. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I was really shocked that 48% of the population is under 200% of the uh, federal poverty level. I was just curious what that figure is, uh, so we know that. And uh, if this is the whole city, this is why I'd really like to see a study of just the east side uh, to see exactly what percentage that is of if we took out the west side. Uh, I think it would yeah. really help the city council on the uh, policy. Yeah, Jason, the, the, that's a good question. The the health and uh, equity uh, background report, which is available on the website, has all that information. So I encourage you to um, to to take a look at it there, and that's been provided to the city council as well. Okay, and also I noticed on the uh, the distance map, it shows uh, less mm -hmm. than ten minutes to uh, to existing park. A lot of these areas are colored dark purple, and there's no park around whatsoever. And then also I noticed uh, on the future parks, then uh, there's uh, some parks that are industrial areas that you guys put, and I identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight parks. Uh, like there's no park on the far west side, and there's no park uh, between 40th and 47th north of Palmdale Boulevard. 
Uh, this should be parked J Jason? near the uh, waterway. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I think that you're referring to a map that we haven't presented yet, uh, right? Which is later on in the presentation. So uh, why don't we wait till we get to that map and then you can share your thoughts so that everyone can see what you're referring to. Also just wanted to share that I just sent a link out to everyone in the meeting, um, which would take us directly to the health and equity background report. We also presented this to the GPAC in October of last year, and there's a presentation on the project website if you want to learn more about that and those topics. Um, and then we also got a message in the chat from a member of the public requesting to speak right now. And I think we are going to request that members of the public hold their comments till later in the meeting, just so we can get through um, the next couple sections. Let's keep moving. Um, let's go to the policy framework. So the policy framework um, uh, is posted on the Palmdale 2045 website as well. Uh, it is much more detailed than the presentation here. So I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at um, not just the, these policy frameworks, but also the ones that were previously, um, previously um, discussed. Um, so the policy frameworks are an interim step. Um, they build on the 1993 general plan and are our, our, our initial ideas for policy direction. Um, these do not contain all the final goals and policies um, yet, um, but they articulate the general policy direction on the topic and then um, with additional policies and measures that will be included in the public draft plan. So these are our first take at them, their drafts, we would like your input. And so if you see something that's not being addressed, let us know and um, we'll, uh, we can discuss it further. Um, the policy framework is organized in three layers, outcomes, goals, and policies. Um, one of the aims is, um, so outcomes are statements where we want to be in 2045, which is the time horizon of the general plan. Uh, we have goals that implement the, um, that address those outcomes. Um, and the policies are specific statements that, um, that guide decision-making. So what cities need to do to, what the city needs to uh, implement to, to achieve that goal. Um, we also have performance metrics and targets, and these are intended to support ongoing assessment of implementation. So the city can use these targets and performance metrics over the next 25 years on a regular basis, annually, biannually, or some other period to assess how, uh, how well the city is uh, progressing towards uh, achieving the goals and uh, reaching the outcomes that are that are included in the general plan. So let's start with the desired health and equity outcomes that have been uh, included in the, in the um, policy framework. Um, and these are expanded economic opportunities for existing residents. Um, and these are tied to jobs, job training, um, uh, et cetera. Um, other outcomes are diversity in housing stock. Um, I think we have previously shared in previous meetings that um, most of the housing in Palmdale today is multifamily, excuse me, single family, and there is the need for additional multifamily uh, units which are more affordable than, uh, than single family uh, to, for, for the current residents, the current population, as well as future residents. Um, other outcomes are improved opportunities for physical activity, improved air quality, as well as um, improved access to healthy food through um, food sales with grocery stores and other retailers, but as well as other ways of uh, improving that access that we'll go uh, describe in a bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa, I know we had a poll here, so why don't you launch that poll? 
Yes, thank you. Um, this poll again is open to everyone. We are asking how important are the following health and equity outcomes for the future of Palmdale? Please tell us whether each outcome is very important, somewhat important, not too important, or not at all important. And these are for the equity, health and equity outcomes on the screen here. I'll read them off quickly. Um, expanded economic opportunity for residents, increased number of multifamily housing units is actually is just a more general diversity in housing stock, um, followed by improved opportunities for physical activity, improved air quality, strengthened access to healthy food. And I believe that's the last one. So please take a few seconds and answer um, these poll questions and we'll share the results with everyone shortly. I think we're going to go ahead and close the poll. If you haven't already, please submit your responses quickly. So in terms of expanded economic opportunity for residents, majority of folks, 82% feel it's very important, followed by 18% who feel it's somewhat important. In terms of diversity of housing or, or increase in number of multifamily units, 64% um, agree that it's very important, 32% feel it's somewhat important, and 5% feel it's not important at all. In terms of improved opportunities for physical activity, 50% feel it's very important, 45% feel it's somewhat important, and 5% feel it's not too important. In terms of improved air quality, 68% feel it's very important, 27 feel it's somewhat important, and 5% feel it's not too important. And lastly, strengthened access to healthy foods. 68 feel it's very important. 23% feel it's somewhat important. And split both with 5% feel it's not too important or not important at all. All right, thanks everyone. We're gonna close this. Thank you, everyone. Um, so tied with the outcomes are the performance metrics that are on the uh, on the screen here, and uh, this includes uh, a target number of youth to participate youth to participate in job training programs um, and connected connecting them to employment opportunities in local industries um, by 2045. Um, diversified choices in housing with a certain number of multifamily units by 2045 with a certain percentage of those being affordable units, um, greatly increased access to parks, trails, and open space, um, as well as grocery stores um, um, within, within a 20 minute walk, um, and then uh, a target number of uh, new trees uh, to be planted in the city uh, to help improve air quality. So now let's go over the goals and policies uh, for health and equity. The policy framework document has 16 goals uh, tied to this topic, and uh, we have shared seven of those. Uh, of those major goals are shared on the screen here, and we'll be we focusing on five of these today to get, get your input. Uh, and these five are shown in the dark blue boxes. Um, please review the document uh, and provide feedback on the full framework as well. We would appreciate your uh, your thoughts on uh, on the entire document so the first goal is uh tied to promoting access to quality health care um while the city does not directly provide health care there are several ways the cities can facilitate improved access um the policies that are in, um, are uh being recommended for this include uh, implementation of the three health and wellness districts across the city, uh, one around the Palmdale Regional Medical Center, uh, one near Kaiser, 
on Avenue S um, and a new district on Bombdale uh, and 40th to 45th Street East, Bombdale Boulevard uh, and 40th to 45th Street East. Um, a related policy is to work with transit agencies to improve transit service to these facilities. Um, we, have, um, we have found that uh, access to transit is often, uh, access via transit is one of the ways to help improve, um, help improve uh, folks being able to utilize the healthcare that, uh, that is uh, actually being, uh, is available for, for residents. Uh, another, um, another uh, healthcare related uh, policy is tied to, um, the fact that the entire city of Palmdale has been identified as a mental health provider shortage area. This is a federal um, designation and uh, the policy uh, to deal with address that includes working with the County of Los Angeles uh, Health Department to provide additional programs and services to improve access to mental health care um, in Palmdale. And it can also include programs and services that help reduce stress and uh, address other uh, mental health considerations, especially for vulnerable populations. Um, this goal is uh, encourage safe and sanitary housing. Um, and the policies include ensuring uh, ongoing and effective health and safety code um, enforcement, prioritizing rental properties, um, especially those that are uh, located in the disadvantaged communities. Um, another policy is to consider a housing rehabilitation program that assists multi-residential, uh, multi-family residential property owners uh, to improve their properties, uh, thus improving the affordable rental housing supply that's already in, in the city. Um, Another policy includes um, working with Los Angeles County and other regional regional agencies uh, to establish a re lead removal program for homes. Um, those were built over 1980. Um, as you may know, um, lead-based paint was banned in 1978. Um, so 1980 is used as a proxy for um, establishing whether a home might actually have lead paint used in it and remediating that is, uh, is really important, um, especially for those who have, um, who have young kids um, and might, uh, might ingest uh, lead. Um, another policy is to uh, prepare a healthy design checklist and uh, update zoning requirements that facilitate new development that is conducive to a healthier lifestyle. Um, the, um, so that new development encourages walkability, use of bikes, um, has open space and parks, as well as access to, um, to other ways to improve the, um, to have a more active lifestyle uh, and uh, address issues such as obesity. Another goal, um, which is similar, uh, is uh, to provide a range of uh, opportunities and choices to residents to exercise. Um, this is another way to improve health outcomes. Uh, and Melissa will talk about this in a little bit more detail in the parks and recreation um, section uh, shortly. But uh, the goal is to um, or the policies address improving access to parks and open space, especially in those areas uh, where um, where that access is more limited, and uh, to provide trail connections um, to connect up with the larger regional trail uh, system, so it's safer and easier to access those areas for um, for improving physical activity. Um, and again, there are opportunities and the policy uh, policy is to um, work with the local school districts to allow city residents to access outdoor recreational areas during non-school hours. And uh, 
and then finally to uh, enhance existing streetscapes um, to uh, be safer for uh, to, uh, to encourage uh, walking uh, as well as uh, having additional safety features for street crossings and tra traffic calming. Um, the next goal is tied to relay uh, and related to improving air quality. Um, Tony, this kind of touches at how do we address uh, the issues we had identified earlier. Um, and the policies include planting new, more street trees, a significant number of new street trees to help with uh, both shade, but also help improve air quality. Uh, other policies include transitioning the city's vehicle fleet to lower emission fuel technologies. Um, as we discussed in the mobility framework, uh, designating truck routes which, uh, so that they avoid sensitive land uses where feasible, uh, working with Caltrans to potentially rerouting truck traffic on Palmdale Boulevard to, an, uh, to Bear Blossom Highway, um, developing a citywide air quality monitoring program um, to, to track um, areas with high emissions as well as to track uh, changes over time and um, suggesting potential um, interventions. And then through the land use element, um, avoiding the siting of sensitive uses near uh, land uses that produce localized air pollution. And sensitive uses include schools, senior housing, childcare centers, um, and, uh, and affordable housing. Uh, this goal is uh, related to providing access to affordable and high quality produce. Um, the city of Palmdale today does not have um, any certified farmer's market here. And uh, a policy is to uh, work to attract one or more um, of, of, uh, of these um, events to the city. These usually have local um, or nearby um, pro producers of produce who sell um, who sell produce at these events and is a, a great way of um, making a fresh produce uh, accessible to, to the local community. Um, there are also uh, other incentives that the city can um, provide to locate for grocery stores to sell fresh and healthy foods, uh, especially those that locate in uh, the areas identified as disadvantaged and to improve transit access to these stores. Um, in the land use element, we talked about village centers, which is where grocery stores might locate. Um, and since those are intended to be within a 20 minute uh, walking distance from the residents, um, the, uh, the um, general plan encourages that um, that access to healthy food is uh, much more achievable achievable in the future than, than it is today. Um, other um, policies include uh, limiting fast food and liquor stores in neighborhoods with a significant concentration um, near child sensitive areas, especially schools, parks, and child care facilities. And, um, and then uh, another policy is to uh, encourage local food production, community gardens, uh, and uh, farmers markets, as I mentioned, on vacant or underutilized parcels. Um, so this is a summary of, um, of the goals. Um, I won't read these out again, but I see Aurora has a hand up. So Aurora, go ahead, uh, ask your question. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what is it that you guys, how is it that you guys determine what communities are disadvantaged? Like, what do you guys use to identify disadvantaged communities? Um, we had, um, so the state establishes a methodology that we are required to use um, to establish which census tracts are considered disadvantaged. 
Um, and um, we had covered that at a previous GPAC meeting. We can share the information with you again, to, and um, you know we can also walk you through it at another time. That that was a it's a long process, so um, okay, we, we can do that offline if you like. Yeah, I was just wondering. It's consistent, though, right? It's a consistent definition you guys use. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I'll share a link right now to that presentation from our GPAC meeting back in October. Thank you. If anyone else wants to take a look. Thanks, Melissa. Um, other questions um, before we move on? Yes, Jason. Yeah, I was just saying, how can Antelope Valley Country Club be considered a disadvantaged community? Maybe it's grouped into the census. But it doesn't, yes. these maps need to be able to, so we can focus on the real areas. Like a lot of the industrial areas is disadvantaged community. There's no homes or anything in that area. So I think these maps do, don't do the council or the community any good if they don't really pinpoint the areas. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah, I agree, Jason. The, the, unfortunately, we are required to use the methodology established by the state, which is at the track level, um, we had we were able to isolate the areas that are not populated or have you know just a, a handful of folks um, who live there because the entire census track is identified or tagged with with a very with the metrics of of a very small number. So we we were able to do that, but um, Within the tracks that are identified, you're right. There are areas which are either don't have residents or are um, are potentially not disadvantaged. But we we are doing that for uh, we need to follow the methodology and uh, identify the entire census tract. And I think that's a caveat. Um, we will make sure we share with the council as they as they review the information we provide them um, next week. Aunt Teresa? Yes, I had two questions. My first one was about trees. You had mentioned mm -hmm. um, planting about 600 trees. What types of trees would those be? Um, I think that's to detail the uh, um, uh, determination for the general plan to make. Um, I think the tree, the the tree species that are uh, selected will be uh, done so as a follow up. Um, I think somebody from city staff, you know, the Parks and Rec folks may be able to um, give give us a sense of what kind of trees are appropriate for the Palmdale uh, climate um, and which can help the best our there's several criteria that the general plan will establish. One is, um, you know, drought tolerant. Uh, certainly, given the water uh, considerations we are all facing, shade, uh, especially uh, given how what the weather is Simran. like. Also, you know, the high desert climate. Yes. Sorry, I can chime in a little bit. Um, and it's Steve. If you feel like you want to speak, uh, you are more than welcome. He's our landscape guru and tree. Uh, he's actually a certified arborist, very knowledgeable about this subject. Um, so Perfect. one of the things that we already have is an improved plant palette and he's on unmuted. So I'm going to let him take it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you, Carlene. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, Ms. Hambro, thank you for your question. Um, we have over 22,000 city maintained trees. Uh, we keep a, a tree inventory that we update uh, periodically every year, actually. Uh, we're constantly updating it as we service our urban forest. Um, one of the benefits of that data is we establish a tree diversity um, metrics, and we can see where we have room for improvement. Some of the considerations along with uh, um, drought um, tolerant qualities include resistance to pests and diseases um, and uh, general um, 
genetic attributes that make them uh, strong candidates for our extreme microclimate. Um, the city's approved plant list is um, geared towards um, success here in, in the high desert. And we are certainly always looking for new candidates uh, to incorporate to that list. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you I, I, I do like shade. <laughs> I do love trees and it does help the air quality. Uh, I guess my biggest concern would be um, the water usage, obviously, because we are in the desert and you know, all, all the water issues our state is having. So that's, you know, when you think of 600 trees, I think, wow, that's a lot of water to uh, keep them established. Absolutely. So thank you for your yeah. comment. Uh, my second question was about um, fresh produce. So after mm -hmm. living in Palmdale for a while, <laughs> I have seen um, grocery stores close. And I remember a grocery store that was prolific in uh, fresh produce, but uh, declined as time went on because um, the surrounding population was not purchasing it. And eventually those so a couple of grocery stores that I remember had closed. And um, I'm not sure if it's so much as if to offer fresh produce or to educate the community to uh, make those choices in order to purchase the fresh produce. I mean, it can be there, but it doesn't mean it's going to be purchased. Um, we do have a lot of fast food restaurants. They are convenient. I have used them myself. <laughs> You know, especially you have a long day, long commute, you just want to grab something and go home. So uh, then you don't go and buy that fresh produce. And of course, it has a certain, um, you know, life shelf. It, it only stays around for as long as it can. So uh, that's just a concern I have. If we have grocery stores that uh, offer this, but then it's not purchased, then the grocery stores won't offer it and then eventually close down. And that's what has happened in the past. So that's a, just an observation I just wanted to uh, mention. Thank you. And thank you, Teresa. Um, I think you also raised a good point about, um, about an educational campaign um, to, um, which can lead to an educational campaign about the benefits of healthier food. And this can be, happen in conjunction with, uh, with the schools um, and through the school's hot meal program. So, Aurora? Hi, sorry. In the last question? slide, um, you mentioned something about, there was something about policies um, about for limiting, I think, alcohol, uh, the proximity or the proliferation, I think, of liquor stores and tobacco stores. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering, to what extent can the GPAC, um, and I guess, push for those kind of policies or what, what role do we play in that? Um, all final decisions are will be made by the city council. And so in the, the direction, we, uh, the feedback we get tonight and at other times we share that with council and they make the final determination of what will be included in the um, in the general plan, um, but with regard to uh, location of liquor stores, the city already has um, distance requirements that are established. And uh, I know Carlene could talk a little bit more about what the city is already doing uh, to limit uh, the proliferation of uh, liquor stores in certain areas. Carlene, did you want to add um, something to that? Um, Megan might be a better person to answer the okay. question on distance separations and um, things of that nature with our municipal code, but we do have pretty extensive restrictions on where uh, alcohol and tobacco locations can enter into the city. Um, I don't know, Megan, if you want to add anything. Sure. Yeah, we uh, we do have a list of sensitive uses that are considered for different alcohol establishment types and tobacco establishment types. Um, and depending on the type of use, there are separations from churches and schools and residences and, and things like that. 
Thank you. Sorry, I feel like I opened a can of worms here, but um, it's just, um, I think in my experience, I've seen like the different exemptions that have been made. So that I mean, that's like a whole other discussion, but that's why I was asking about the policies that we can, like if we could um, push for certain kind of policies. Thank you, Aurora. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I just had a quick point about mental health. Um, you know, there's a, mm -hmm. these are all great bullet points that you covered. Uh, but under the collaboration with LA County and uh, regional health organizations to improve the mental health care, uh, one thing that really came to mind, um, you know, is maybe collaboration with the school districts and actually, you know, educating our, our kids on not only how to identify, but how to cope with different mental um, illnesses. I know that might be out of our scope, but I just wanted to bring that up. That's a really good, uh, good point, Matt. We'll make a note of that and uh, discuss it with staff and uh, bring that to the uh, to the council. Okay, doing a quick time check here. Um, let's move on to the next portion of the presentation, which is um, the outcomes, goals, and policies for parks and recreation. Hi, Melissa. Yeah, we actually have a quick poll on the previous slide if there's time. Sorry, let's move on to um, to Parks and Rec. I think we had the discussion in general. Okay, let me get situated here. So we are looking at, um, yes, yeah, so desired Parks and Rec outcomes um, so as we get into the goals and policies for Parks and Rec, we're going to begin with the desired outcome, um, similar to what Simran just walked us through for um, health and equity. Um, these are essentially uh, where we want to be at 2045. Um, so starting with connectivity, connections to new and existing parks, open space, and recreational facilities from neighborhoods. Thinking about new park land, we want to identify and acquire land for new parks in coordination with state um, with local, state, and federal partners. Partnerships, we want to maintain and expand existing programs with Antelope Valley Partners for Health and other similar organizations that provide recreational amenities and upgrades to existing facilities, including amenities and active and passive recreation areas to make them accessible for people of all ages and abilities. Um, and do we want to skip this poll as well? Now let's Let's do this poll. Okay, so let me pull up. Is related to parks and rec outcomes. I'm going to launch this right now. Um, so this asks, how important are the following parks and rec outcomes for the future of Palmdale? Please tell us um, whether each outcome is very important, somewhat important, not too important, or not important at all. Um, and again, these are for the outcomes listed on the screen connectivity, new parkland, partnerships, and upgrades to existing facilities. Please take a moment and submit your responses, and then we'll share with everyone. I think we have most folks um, responses in. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. In terms of connectivity, 71% feel it's very important, 25% feel it's somewhat important, and 4% feel it's not too important. New Parkland, 63% feel it's very important, 25% feel it's somewhat important, and 13% feel it's not too important. Partnerships, 54 agree or feel that it's very important. 42% feel it's somewhat important and 4% feel it's not too important. And lastly, upgrades to existing facilities, 64% feel it's very important. 
25% feel it's somewhat important and 8% feel it's not too important. I'm going to stop sharing these results. Thanks everyone for participating in that. And we can move to the next slide. Um, so now we're going to walk through the proposed goals. These are six of the seven proposed parks and recreation goals. Um, the ones that are shown in darker blue are the ones we're going to discuss in greater detail tonight. All of them are obviously in the um, report that was sent out to our GPAC members in advance of the meeting, um, and it's also on the project website. Um, so the first goal ties everything together. It's the provision of parks and rec facilities that meet the needs of existing and future residents. And the other goals include expanding parkland, maintaining a network of multi-use trails, and passive and active open space, funding opportunities for development of new parks, and providing safe and fun programming for all ages. On the next slide, go into greater detail for our first goal, which is the parks and rec facilities to meet needs of existing and future residents. Um, there's several policies listed here that help get us to our goal of, of providing more parks and rec facilities. This includes preparing a parks master plan, which will provide a greater level of detail in addressing parks and rec needs includes facilities and programs and identifying future funding opportunities and sources, um, providing parks and rec opportunities equitably distributed throughout Palmdale, so all residents have access to parks within a 20-minute walk of their home. As it stands now, we know there are neighborhoods that have a much further walk to access a park, and we want to reduce or eliminate that burden in the future if possible. Um, we want to provide culturally sensitive programming at recreation facilities, so offering types of programs that are sensitive or responsive to differences in culture. Um, another policy is accessibility to parks and rec facilities. Um, this is a common theme. We want people to be able to access different types of facility, facilities regardless of their physical or cognitive abilities. Another policy is that in the future, we want to prioritize the development of new parks and rec facilities in areas that are currently underserved by parks and rec. Um, and we also want to encourage low cost or free recreation for residents. Um, something we heard directly from our GPAC is that cost was a burden, particularly for youth in accessing recreation. So that's something we want to address through this policy. Um, we also have a policy that encourages expansion of amenities at public parks. We have another policy that evaluates the adopted park standard, which right now is at five acres per 1,000 residents. And we want to ask, is this the right um, metric to gauge parks in the future? Um, and that includes um, designations for types of parks and also guidelines for future park facilities. Um, another policy is to incorporate all design features required by the ADA to improve park access for all. Um, and then lastly, co-locating schools and parks um, in partnership with nonprofit organizations to provide recreational opportunities that benefit students and the public, um, but doesn't hinder our ability to get parks funding for development of future parks, which is something we heard from our GPAC at a recent meeting. Um, so on the next slide, we have our second goal, which is passive and active open space network, um, which is supported mainly by these two policies, which aim to create an open space network that preserves corridors along fault zones, natural drainage courses, and other natural physical characteristics that connect to a larger um, open space network. We've jumped a couple slides ahead. Um, I'll keep going just so we can. Sorry about that. No problem. So we're back on, yeah, that's it. Um, and then the second policy here mentions the provision of access points, um, multi-use trails and interpretive information at open space areas that support passive recreation. Go to the next slide. And the third goal that we're gonna talk about tonight is the provision of multi-use trails. Um, which is supported by several policies, um, starting with multi-use trails that connect to existing or planned trails. We want a continuous network of trails. Um, we know there are inherent challenges with accessibility and outdoor trails, so whenever possible, we want to provide trail design, including trailhead materials, 
that are ADA accessible. This can be visually or physically um, and other considerations that support access for all. Uh, we want to encourage and prioritize multi-use trail connections to existing neighborhoods, public parks and public facilities, continuing this theme of access and equity. Um, another policy is to provide trail support facilities throughout multi-use trails. So things like benches, trash cans, and signage. Another policy is to support expanding our network. We want to explore different methods of acquiring trail easements or right-of-ways and pursue funding sources that would allow for trail acquisition and construction. Um, we know that acquiring land and funds can be huge barriers for a city. So if we find other opportunities that may help us get more trail, uh, a larger trail network. And then lastly, whenever possible, we wanna encourage use of grant funding um, and private donations to finance trail construction. On the next slide, we have a future parks and trail network map. Um, this is a new map. This is likely to change. Um, this is uh, a composite of existing parks shown in, I shouldn't say likely to change, likely to, to be updated and, and revisions as we go through, um, as with all of our other goals, policies, and maps um, while we are developing the draft plan. So I'll say, um, starting with existing parks shown in olive green, the planned future park. This is the city property that's been earmarked for park development, though it's not clear when that funding might be available. That's shown in brighter teal. Um, and that's, I think, primarily on the east side of town. And then the existing trailheads are shown in purple. So we took a look at the preferred land use map, which is that map that we finished um, earlier this year with all land uses for the city of Palmdale. And we look specifically where residential and future mixed use are compared to the existing or planned parks. And we kind of looked for where the gaps in access might be. And that's how we came up with these green, Kelly green circles with the concentric rings. Um, those are areas that we think future parks might want to be. We're calling these future park priority areas. Um, and these are a general vicinity. Um, I know we've mentioned several times that we can't allocate or designate private property as a public park, um, but we can say what area in the future might need parks. And as when development occurs, that um, areas should be considered when, when, all, when at all possible for um, developing a future park. Um, another layer of this map is the key access point to Parks and Rec. That, those are the um, dashed green lines that cover um, some of the major corridors of town. So this kind of ties in our circulation network and highlights um, potential future multimodal streets that would support walking and biking. So we're highlighting these corridors to show how someone might be able to access a future park. I think those are the main highlights here. Someone feel free to jump in if I missed something. Um, we can always come back to this map. I think we have one more slide. Yes. So um, this last slide is just an overview of the six, uh, six of the seven parks and rec goals. And we have one poll here, which I think we can run. Um, let me pull this up. Quick poll, I'm gonna launch this now and ask, um, do these goals address the vision themes and outcomes identified for parks and recreation for the general plan update? And your options are yes, no, or I'd like to share additional comment and you can raise the hand, um, the raise hand tool and we'll call on you. Please take a moment to um, submit your responses and we'll share the results shortly. If you haven't already, please submit your response. Okay, I'm gonna close this poll and share our results. 
So um, when asked if these goals address the vision themes and outcomes identified for Parks and Rec in the general plan update, 89% of folks agreed that yes, they do. 5% um, split said no, they don't, or I would like to share additional comments. So if you, um, someone wants, has a question or an additional comment to share, please raise your hand. We can call on you. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, yeah, like I said, I just think there should be more areas identified uh, on the map. Uh, there's like trains and there's, uh, you know, roads and uh, mm -hmm. that you can't cross if you're in a neighborhood. And so you need to look at that. Also, the train owns uh, the train tracks own some land that could be used for uh, pocket parks that we could look at, like on 40th Street East where the train crosses. Uh, also, uh, I noticed we didn't talk about any historical significant areas in in this. Uh, I'd like to see the city of Palmdale start a, a state conservancy district and a conservancy job corps. That way we it open up more opportunities for grants locally and we could hire all the foster kids and stuff to take care of the trails and work in the uh in the in the city parks. We're one of the only areas in the whole state of California that doesn't have one. We've lost hundreds of millions of dollars, Antelope Valley has. Um, we've talked about a, a youth commission. Uh I read it in the pa packet. Uh we, I'd like to see a parks and recreation commission also and a senior commission added. Uh, also, uh, I think that the, uh, I always lose my train of thought. Oh, on this thing, it says 90% of the uh, city wants to be within 20 minutes of a park. I think we should make it 10 minutes to a walkable uh, park if we wanna be a walkable community. I think we, instead of 600 trees, I'd like to see a thousand trees added if we're really gonna try to reduce air quality, uh, make air quality better. Uh, we need 5,000 job training. I think we need 10,000 job training. We graduate over 2,000 kids every year from the, uh, the three high schools and the charter schools. And we're trying to do that by 2045 and we're 50,000 jobs short as commuters. And it says 50,000 units uh, or low income, 20% of it to be low income. I think in Antelope Valley, 50% of all new development should be affordable housing. Uh, um, and I think we need 10,000, not 5,000. Uh, uh, Jason, Jason, can you hold the rest of your comments? Uh, I wanna try and get to the breakout room so that the members of the public who have been patiently waiting uh, this whole time uh, can share their thoughts as well. Uh, would that be okay? Thank you. Um, so Melissa is going to assign the members of the public to a breakout room. Um, it'll be facilitated by Ben Fist, uh, who's a senior planner with the city, and Megan Taggart, uh, the planning manager. Um, so they'll be able to answer any questions you might have, as well as um, record your comments and thoughts. Um, We'll, I'll continue, I and Melissa will continue in the main room with the members of the GPAC uh, and continue our discussion here. Uh, we'll do a short report back after we are back as a group, and then there'll be an opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting as well. So Melissa, if you wanna send folks to, um, to those groups. Uh, in the small groups, we want you want to hear about if there are other outcomes and policy ideas that we should consider, and your thoughts on um, on the ones that we did share today. So the breakout room for members of the public has been opened. If you haven't accepted your invitation yet, please do that now. We have have a few folks who are um, in the main room. I think we can get started with our GPAC discussion. Okay. All right, Jason, uh, if you wanted to um, finish your, uh, uh, your comments um, and then others, 
I don't remember the Fuji so, back. Um, I think it, what's really it. missing, yeah, what, what's really missing in our community that we need to emphasize is our community groups who are really suffering with uh, membership and stuff, uh, anywhere from the women's club to the moose lodge to, uh, you know, high school groups uh, and athletic groups. And I think the city needs to have a website with all the listed groups and, uh, and a way for people to donate to these groups too. And also the city foundation too. I think that we need to have a festival of the community groups where people can come out and visit these community groups and try to make their uh, the group stronger. The Emerald Club that used to, you know, gives uh, tacos out at the fairground, they didn't have enough members, so they quit doing it uh, last year. They've been doing that for 50 years. So I don't think there's enough pride in Palmville. Uh, Rachel Garcia, this, uh, the, our Olympian who won the silver medal, we didn't have any, um, you know, posters of her around town or Olympic flags or anything to kind of create some pride about her going to the Olympics. So that was kind of sad. We didn't celebrate Mayor Pete Knight's uh, world record, you know, 50th anniversary. We didn't even celebrate it uh, two years ago. And uh, we just don't have any aerospace pride like we used to in the 80s with the space shuttle and everything like that. And yet we're, we're building things that outdo the space shuttle and everything. Uh, the the Ponder Boulevard rerouting it, uh, we shouldn't use Parabossum Highway, we should use Avenue M if we're going to try to reroute it off, but we should emphasize the P8 freeway and building that from the freeway to 50th Street East. But uh, rerouting uh, traffic to Parabossum Highway, you're adding probably 30 minutes to a drive and people aren't going to do that. Uh, like I said, we need Thanks. to increase the dwellings. We need to increase uh, uh, from 5,000 to 10,000 uh, for low income in the next 50, uh, by 2045, 25 years, we're only gonna build that. And we're gonna add, how many people are we gonna add in the next 25 years? I'd like to know that, the population. So we kind of have a group on that. And to know that we're, oh, uh, we only have about 45% of the parkland that we're supposed to have, according to five acres per thousand people. We're 435 acres short right now at our population level. We should have 800 acres. We only have 365 acres. And also I wanna make another note of the historical significance. We haven't talked about that at all in the general plan. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Jason. Go ahead, uh, Matt. Yeah, I just had a question in regards to uh park acreage would a museum be counted as a park and if so you know like kind of spinning off what jason was talking about like the aerospace you know i know we have the air park but having something more indoors and uh, really uh, glorifying our aerospace um history um you know just a thought I, i'm just curious if that count as a park um museums technically don't count as parks if they are, um, you know, if they are primarily uh, exhibit, but if there are grounds associated with it, which are uh, have other recreational opportunities, then the, those could be um, considered as such. So. So what about other members of the GPAC? Um, are there other outcomes we should consider for both health and equity and uh, parks and recreation that we haven't um, talked about yet? What about um, uh, what about um, other policies that we haven't discussed? Jason, I see your hand up. So, and Aurora, I think you had your hand up earlier. Why don't you go first, Aurora, and then uh, oh. Jason, and then Matthew? I, I didn't have a hand up. I had put like little uh, hands clapping thing when Jason was talking because oh, he was making really good points. Think, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, so go ahead, uh, Jason, and then Matt. Yeah, I think we need uh, senior centers senior centers on the east side and west side. 
we're we're big cities. We're we're three or four cities, uh, really in in reality, land wise. So I think that uh, we could put a light, little community room next to one of these parks where seniors could just hang out, play pool, read books, and just socialize. Uh, also, the uh, schools, it's one thing to have an agreement with schools, but the new school, uh, we have to have a, uh, the schools plan the, the park area, I mean, their recreation area, where there's access to the community. If you're going to build a school and then all the recreation stuff's behind a big wall, you know, maybe the park needs to be in front of the school instead of in back of the school. So it's not just an agreement with the schools, but future schools being designed where the community can access them. Uh, Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, just had a question in regards to the five acres per a thousand residents. Is that a standard that we created in 1993? Or is that dictated by the state or is that something that's negotiable? Um, I guess that's kind of like my policy question of the day. Yeah, um, the five acres per thousand population was in the last uh, general plan, the 1993 general plan. Um, the recommended number is, um, and this is with the Parks and Recreation uh, Association, the um, international association has a three acres per thousand population. That's a pretty typical number. So the city's goal is higher than that. Um, and I think it's related to the natural setting that the city is already in. It, um, it celebrates that. Um, and I think there are folks from the city who can um, maybe Gary or um, Eric um, can talk about that a little bit more. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Eric, I'm the Deputy Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, that's a good question, Matt. Um, three acres per 1,000 um, is, is a standard. Um, but you know, five acres per 1,000 is on NRPA, which is the National Recreation and Parks Association. Um, that's that's kind of their typical standard is five acres per 1,000. I think um, um, that's a that's a pretty solid goal to have um, for for acreage per 1,000. Thank you. Eric. Yeah. Other questions, uh, comments? Go ahead, Jason. Sorry, guys. Uh, I just want to emphasize uh, the inland port is the most one of the most important things in Antelope Valley for manufacturing. And we got to emphasize this in that general plan. And it goes along with the airport. Because uh, now we can manufacture stuff in America cheaper than what China can make it because of robotics and 3D printing. So we need to push on that big time in the manufacturer here so they don't have to ship it all the way from Asia to here. The other thing is Corson uh, Shopping Center, the Corson Park area, uh, which I call is downtown. It needs a grocery store. These people need a grocery store. This is the most unequitable thing we have going on in Palmdale. We need to get the county out of the grocery store across the street or down by 25th Street and have their offices down there. This community needs their grocery store. It's not right what, what's going on. These people don't have any cars. You know, they're low income. They need a grocery store. Uh, the other thing is I'd like to see a city zoo and like Bakersfield has, Palm Springs has. I just came from Glendale, Arizona. They have one. Uh, also, the uh, an arboretum. Why can't we have an arboretum? You know, uh, grow different uh, trees and plants and have that near the city zoo. We need to have parks by the Palmdale Lake, Una Lake, and Indian Ponds. Which what you guys don't know is that it's a natural spring on 40th and the Aqueduct, 40th Street East and the Aqueduct. There's ponds out there in the springs. It's an Indian grounds. There's Indian artifacts. We call it the haunted ponds as a kid. Uh, and the city, uh, the Palmdale Water District owns the land around Una Lake. 
So it's, it'd be an easy natural park to uh, work on together. We could have an Apollo park right there. So it's just uh, working together and, and, you know, throwing ideas together and making something great. Uh, that's it. That's all I can think of right now. I'll, I'll email you guys anything else. Thank you, Jason. Um, Tony. I, I think that, you know, all these ideas are great, but I mean, how much money do we have? We have to prioritize what the city can and can't do. Um, I mean, our budget's not unlimited and I mean, we can't have everything that we want. I mean, you know, I always wanted a pony, but I just never got one myself. Um, I think that we have to look at, at everything that's going on in Palmdale and decide what's the most important thing for the community. And we also, one of the biggest things is I hear during the conversations, I've been to, I think this is our 17th meeting. I've been to 16 of them. And one of the things I know has upset a few of the members is the inequity between the East and the West side. And I'd love a study to find out, well, what is the inequity? I mean, how much money is being spent on each side in terms of property values, or excuse me, in terms of uh, investment uh, parks and everything else. And that way we don't have this perception that one side's better than the other, that the freeways is, is some type of boundary that divides us all. Do we have some type of study? Do we have something within the general plan that, that uh, addresses that? Um, so the general plan um, doesn't have a specific study um, that compares in, uh, public investments on the east and west side. Um, the identification of the areas, um, those are perceptions, but they are, um, they are um, the analysis we did is, uh, is supporting that. And this is the analysis that I talked about earlier in the presentation, and it was more detailed in our, uh, in our previous uh, presentation, that there are health and there are outcomes, health outcomes and equity outcomes that are specific to uh, portions of the east side where there's uh, higher concentrations of both lower income as well as uh, uh, as well as people of color. Um, or, I, under uh, I, under I understand. I understand that, but a lot many of those inequities are, you know, may have to do with also, you know, certain prices, home prices. Um, houses are more expensive on the west side, but I don't think that it's a, a, a separation that's on purpose. It just is what it is at this point. It's geographics. And I don't know how you can address that unless, of course, you use that. Uh, I think you, you were talking about 20 homes per community and allowing certain lower income housing and certain, you know, obviously in certain uh, construction zones and things like that. But um, outside of that, geographically, I don't think that much of that is going to change unless you have there's another solution there. I'm not quite certain. Yeah, well, home prices are a, are a function of um, it's a chicken and an egg thing. Uh, condition, home conditions, uh, neighborhood conditions affect home prices and, and the reverse as well. So um, I think the, the analysis that we have presented show that there are some disparities, some are perceived, some are real, and uh, in investments or, dis or policies in the general plan can over time help address those um, uh, disparities. Um, uh, Aurora and then Pat. Hi, um, so uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the disparities between the two, there's a, I think there's the large amount of um, resources, but I know that the, the county has a Healthy Places Index, I believe it's called, Healthy Places Index, which allows you to look at the two communities and it allows you like to filter through the different, um, different I guess, indicators that show um, mm -hmm. like the lower life expectancy and different things that uh, contribute to that. And then um, I also, um, I used to work with um, the sheriffs with their VITA program. And I know that um, during one of the presentations that I was doing, one of the sheriffs kind of like, um, he, he jumped in on the conversation and he kind of started pointing out to the kids that um, he was telling them he, well, what he had perceived. And I think that this is something I hadn't noticed before was, you know, he was telling them that there's a lot of 
differences between the east and west side like pawn shops like you don't see pawn shops on the west side you don't see like a, as many like of the payday loan places on the west side just different things i think that play into it so i think that's just something to take into consideration thank you Aurora. um pat well when it comes to the real estate <laughs> the su supply and demand is what's dictating the, the real estate market right now and i don't think that's going to change a whole lot over the next few years until tracks can be built and we can get our inventory up. Um, the thought that keeps coming to me through all the conversations about trees and parks and all that stuff is that we live in a high desert. We have some extreme weather and cold in the winter, hot in the summer, really hot in this summer. Um, we have a, a severe drought. Not sure how long it's going to take to come out of that. I keep in mind, keep thinking that we're looking at a 25 year plan and this is what this is as a roadmap on, on our growth. I don't remember what the projected growth of Palmdale is over the next 20, 25 years. But um, I think that a lot of uh, economic factors in our country are gonna dictate on how that plays out. Um, again, we, we need development and I know there's a lot of development coming, but um, I think that the price of um, uh, the construction is is going to really uh, dictate how much development comes and, and how, how we can uh, grow. But um, obviously, we can't designate land. It was, you brought that up early in the meeting about uh, designating land for certain uses without owning the land. And um, so those are a lot of things to take into consideration. And I think that... Uh, Looking at the plan that we're we're working with right now, we've made good progress, and I think we're pretty much where we need to be for the next 25 years in planning. I got little issues, little concerns here and there, but otherwise, I what I see is it looks good. Thank you, Pat. Um, Teresa, and then Aurora. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to point out, as we were talking about statistical um, information regarding the east side versus the west side, um, Gavia, which is the Greater Antelope Valley Economic Alliance, they do put out a report every year, to, and it's actually um, available on their website also. It gives a very in-depth account of the entire city as per zip code. So it does break down um, you know, housing, and um, median income and education. And it's a very, very useful tool if you are very excited about statistics like we were talking about trying to compare East versus West. It's a very, very good tool to have. Um, once again, that's the Greater Antelope Valley Economic Alliance. And they do put out an annual roundtable report every year. Thank you, uh, thank you, Terry. Um, and, um, in addition to that, in the analysis we had previously presented, and that was not done by uh, zip code, um, which is more intuitive um, to some extent, but by census tract, but both uh, Calid Virus Screen, Healthy Places Index, as well as um, as um, and there are other uh, in, in indices that um, look at um, impacts across uh, across census tracts and uh, other similar um, jurisdictional um, boundaries. Um, Aurora, you had your hand up. I think it's down now. Um, Terry, did you have um, another comment? Nope, just took my hand down, sorry. Great. Um, I think the other group is back. Oh, they'll be back in about a minute. Okay. Looks like they're back. Okay. All right. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, Megan or Ben, would one of you do a report back from the uh, from the breakout room? 
Sure. So we did have some good um, discussion. Some of it was that ensuring that the the multifamily housing that we're envisioning um, is utilized for existing residents rather than those that are um, transplanting from Los Angeles or down in the valley. Um, the group also wanted to make sure that we really are strengthening access to healthy foods and limiting fast food and liquor stores in disadvantaged areas or areas with high crime rates and lowest healthy rates or health rates um, and in general the group wanted to see better food for the community uh, there was a suggestion that residents who were using um, benefits for foods uh, that there were maybe some programs in place that would give them sort of double credits if they used those benefits on healthy foods uh, like produce and then really just educating children and allowing schools or giving schools the tools to ensure that there's healthy foods in our schools for our children. Thank you, Megan. Um, Melissa, did you want to do the report back for, for the main room and I can add on to it? Sure, let me go through my notes up, up here. Um, so we touched on a lot of different things during our discussion. Um, everything from park acreage standards, whether five acres should be the number that we look at to the future um, or consider something different. It seems that five is um, a widely accepted standard. Um, we've also heard that three is as well. Um, for new policies or programs, there is the, the suggestion that we should offer um, more senior centers um, that schools um, should continue to plan um, or when schools are um, creating new um, recreation and parks area, that those areas should be accessible to the public, um, not maybe at the back of the building where um, it's harder to access. Um, certain areas of town are, are lacking um, grocery stores particularly the Corson Park area, the desire to see other types of recreational amenities like maybe a zoo or other parks or ponds. Um, there was a discussion about investment across town and different disparities um, in terms of in investment. Question about um, trees and parks in terms of high desert um, extreme weather. And then um, I think those were the main points that I got. And um, that, that's a good, good summary, Melissa. A couple of things I'd add uh, on is there's a suggestion to include a policy to work with the school district to develop uh, uh, education about mental health issues. Um, so that's, that's something we should definitely consider including. Um, there were also some suggestions for um, creating programs um, and uh, uh, other ways to celebrate um, Palmdale Pride, um, as well as um, uh, work with uh, giving, uh, helping community groups uh, reach their intended audiences, um, both with funding as well as a forum for getting the word out. Um, we also had a lot of discussion about uh, some of the data sources in the analysis we have um, we have done um, and uh, some additional uh, um, thoughts about where to get uh, more uh, data was uh, were all, that was also shared with the group. Okay. Um, so now it's um, time for public comment. Are there members of the public who'd like to uh, speak? tonight. If you do, please raise your hand. I know some, uh, some folks had their hand earlier during the presentation. Um, so now is your chance to, to share your thoughts. I have um, one person, I think their name is Rosie, um, who isn't able to raise their hand. Are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yep. go ahead, Rosie. Okay. So you have two I, minutes. Thank you. I stated earlier that um, 
in order not to, in order to have health equity and in order for the community to be equitable, that all the apartment buildings should not be placed in just one part of the city, which also creates a hardship for the community's local schools and um, all the alcohol outlets that currently exist in the same area where all the apartment buildings are currently being um, created. It's not a great place. And also they're also building a, a McDonald's in that same area. So if we're gonna put in um, more restaurants or whatever, they should be healthy food options not junk food, because junk food is very, very bad for our community, and they're already disadvantaged as it is. So please be mindful, and don't forget about building a bridge to get to the hospital for the East Side people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, Lisa, and then uh, Teresa. Oh, hello. Um, to preserve the desert atmosphere, I was thinking uh, part of our park spaces can be uh, wild Joshua tree woodlands, and this would improve equitable access to nature, and therefore would also uh, would be good for our mental and our physical health to be close to nature. And um, and I think it's also a good idea to have um, some of the schools kind of share their facilities for. Um, park and rec activities. Um, I, you know, I grew up in the 70s and I remember going to uh, Palmdale High School field or Palmdale High School just to ride, you know, ride roller skates and stuff. Um, and then I also wanted to say that um, I think the city of Palmdale has really done a good job so far. Uh, I've lived here since 1970 and, and the place has really grown. But um, as far as, you know, I think you've really done a good job with a lot of the affordable housing and stuff. And uh, most most of the places uh, are really nice and well kept. And, and uh, you know, I don't even, you know, and also too, I'm on the east side and, uh, and it's kind of like a mixture, which I think is kind of a good thing. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Teresa? Hi, yeah. Um, I know um, I love all the plans that we're talking about, and I know some of the things that our city would, uh, you know, uh, community members don't always feel the same way about having bike lanes or having multifamily um, properties come up in their neighborhoods that have single family homes. Um, and I know that another issue is um, even if you uh, zone something for multifamily or you um, want that there you have to get investors to uh, buy in that area and it has to be profitable for them so um, i'm just wondering do you guys have plans on attracting investors um, to to build these how are you uh, what's the plan to um when our community members because i know this has happened already before um, when community members come together and say we don't want multi-families in this area what I'm just wondering if there's a plan to help with that. Yeah, um, that's a really good question, Teresa. Um, state law, um, and especially those um, that have been passed in the last few years, have um, required cities to allow housing by right in areas where they are designated. Um, so um, there is limited opportunity for uh, neighbors to have a project denied. Um, so, um, so that's the short answer to, to that question. And we can have uh, city staff, um, if you want to uh, text uh, or chat your uh, email address to city uh, to Melissa, who's the host, um, she can share your address with, uh, with city staff who can give you more information about this letter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so very briefly, um, I think Melissa will walk us through how to provide uh, comments on the project website. Um, all the policy frameworks we have discussed so far are also available for download, um, downloading and sending an email with any comments, or you can uh, provide those right on the website. Melissa? 
Yeah, thanks, Simran. I just sent everyone in, in the meeting um, a chat with a link to the Palmdale website, which is palmdale2045.org. Um, we have an entire web page dedicated to all the policy frameworks. Um, this meeting just covered two of them, but there are several other documents that we'd love for you to review and comment on. Um, this uh, slide shows what you'll see on the project website. Um, if you click one more time, you also have the ability, in addition to actually viewing the document on the project website, you can also provide comments. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. That burgundy number two shows what it looks like when you place a comment. You'll put your name in, your email address, write your comment. Um, if you click one more time, you'll see what it looks like to review someone else's comments. You can give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down, and you can actually respond to them directly there. Um, if you'd prefer not to do this method, there's also an option to download a PDF of the policy framework. And if you have any comments, you can always email the team. Um, you can scan a PDF or just send us directly what your comments are. Um, all of the policy frameworks will be on the website available for comment through, I believe, the end of this month. Um, and we'd love for your feedback in either way. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and then I want to briefly mention that um, we have we are giving an update to the Planning Commission tomorrow night. So um, you're all invited to attend and provide your comments directly to the Planning Commission if you like. And then on Monday, um, we will be providing an update to the City Council. Um, over the next several months, oh, excuse me, Tuesday. Oh, thank you, Colleen. Uh, over the next several months, we'll be preparing uh, the draft general plan, um, and then that we'll bring that for public review. Um, and then next year, uh, 2022, uh, we'll go through the review and adoption process. So, if I could, so, someone um, just really quickly, um, just a uh, kind of helpful information piece for the meeting on Tuesday. The general plan update will take place at 6 p.m., which is different from the regularly scheduled city council mm -hmm. meeting, which starts after that. So it is a little different for those of the community that are listening in or the GPAC members that wanted to attend. There's a little bit of difference. Thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying, Carleen. Um, well, with that, um, I'd like to thank you again uh, all for joining tonight and providing your comments and uh, suggestions and um, I'd like to wish you all a good night and enjoy the rest of the summer and we'll be in touch with you all over the next uh, few months with more information and please share um, your thoughts and any additional suggestions you might have on the on all the policy frameworks that are available on the website thank you everyone thank you guys